I don't know what this is going to look like until when I project it. It's not bad. It's not bad. I think it's, is that readable with the dark gray? So here at the backdrop of all of our slides in this section is going to be an electron micrograph of a mitochondrion. It's beautiful because without mitochondria, we would not be able to generate the amount of ATP we need to in order to be able to use 100 pounds of it every day in every cell in our body. Okay, so you need to learn to love your mitochondria, every one of them. Name them, love them. All right, so the important questions. Uh, what is important about oxidation reduction reactions? And, and because this is a biology course, we're gonna be biased, but that's okay because biology is the best objectively, so it's okay to operate as though it's the best. Um, do you see that? No bias there. Um, we're going to talk about what's the importance of oxidation reduction reactions as far as living organisms are concerned. What are the major steps of cellular respiration so that this can be your big picture? This can be your big picture. Once you know what you need, it's easier to remember where you get it, right? If any of you, uh, oh man. Never mind. I was going to ask something, but we'll, we'll save that. We'll save that for a minute. We'll save that for a minute. There'll be a question coming. How does glycolysis work? So the first part of cellular respiration, how does it work? And this is where it's just, it's going to be a lot of memorization. Okay. It's got to be a lot of memorization, but again, we'll try to get you the big picture so you know where it all fits. Uh, and then finally, where does the energy come from? Okay. Where does the energy come from? And so when we talk about cellular respiration, we talk about glycolysis, but ultimately the energy has to come from somewhere else. The fuel has to come from somewhere else. We are open systems. We have both matter and energy infused into our bodies. Okay. And so we need to deal with how our body works with the different types of matter it receives. Not all matter is created equally. Metaphysically, of course, not literally, although they aren't the same. It was sorry. All right, so first question, what is important about oxidation reduction reactions? <sighs> okay, well, these oxidation reduction reactions, which we can abbreviate as redox reactions, these redox reactions, they move electrons. And when you move electrons, you create electrical energy. And that electrical energy can be used to synthesize ATP. Okay, so these redox reactions, they fuel electrical energy, and that electrical energy fuels the condensation reaction that is going to take ADP and an inorganic phosphate and make ATP, right? Have you seen this acronym before, oil rig? Oxidation is loss, reduction is gain, and so we've got a donor molecule that gives electrons. It's, it's fun to call it a donor molecule as though, it, as though it gets to choose. Although the things that make great donor molecules are those things that really want to get rid of excess electrons anyways. And so electrons are removed from a donor molecule and simultaneously added to the acceptor. And when these electrons transfer, they release energy. They release electrical energy. They release energy that can be uh, converted into kinetic energy, that can be converted into other types of energy. Oxidation is loss. Reduction is gain. And so if something loses electrons, we say it is oxidized. Now, probably the most familiar place you've seen that term before is in metals as they are exposed to oxygen and become oxidized, as iron rusts or copper gains its patina, or you, ate, you started eating an apple and you left it out on the counter and the sugars in that apple oxidize. Okay, but these reactions are just happening constantly inside of every cell in your body. Reduction is the gain of electrons, so if something gains electrons, we say that it has been reduced which is fun to me that in the midst of something, gaining something, we call it reduced. Is that fun for you? That's fun for me because it's, um, 
it's uh, it doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but that's why it's so wonderful. Sometimes things are memorable because they don't make a lot of sense. Like the ridiculous videos we watch on YouTube, right? Memorable because they don't make a lot of sense. Mm. Okay, now something to keep in mind, and we're gonna see this time and time and time and time again, that, that the, ox the oxidation and the reduction might not be complete. So oxidation is the loss of electrons. It might not be a complete loss. It might be like younger brother has something, older brother realizes he wants it, younger brother doesn't really lose it, but he loses it, right? Does it make sense? Like an uneven sharing? So if you've got, say, carbon, that it's only bound to other carbons and hydrogens, it's sharing all of its electrons equally, yes? Okay, you've got carbon only sharing electrons with other carbons and with hydrogens, it's sharing them equally. But you start getting some oxygens involved and we take that carbon and pull it out of a sugar molecule and put it into carbon dioxide where it's only sharing electrons with oxygen. It hasn't lost the electrons. It still has a complete valence shell, but it's, the electrons are spending a lot more time with the oxygen than they are with the carbon. Okay, so these, this, this oxidation and the reduction, it may be incomplete, okay, where it's not a complete loss, it's not a complete gain, but it's, it's a partial loss, partial gain. That make sense? Okay, a little bit more about the big picture. Any questions about redox reactions and how they apply to life? It's basically everything is rooting back to the transfer of electrons. As electrons transfer, they release energy, and that energy can be harvested and harnessed to do something, like facilitate a condensation reaction to make ATP. All right, so here's a little bit more of the big picture. So in photosynthesis, carbon from carbon dioxide is reduced into the carbons in, uh, in glucose, in sugar. And so here it's starting as carbon dioxide. These, this carbon, if you go and you look at it, it's going to have a complete valence shell. It's going to have eight valence electrons. But if it's sharing all of those electrons with its oxygen partners, it's not getting those electrons very often. Okay? <coughs> In the process of photosynthesis, it is reduced, not completely, but it is reduced into the carbons that we find in the sugar molecule where the carbon's sharing some electrons with other carbons, some of its electrons with hydrogens, and still some with oxygen, okay? But it's getting a lot more time with its electrons, okay? So it's been reduced, it's gained electrons, but it's not a complete reduction, right? It didn't get anything it didn't already have in the first place, it's just spent a little bit more time with what it had, okay? Make sense? Okay, then in cellular respiration, we take those same carbons that were reduced during photosynthesis, and now we oxidize them, okay? So these carbons were reduced during photosynthesis as they are converted from carbon dioxide into a sugar molecule, and then in cellular respiration, they are oxidized. The electrons, but it's not a complete oxidation, it's a partial oxidation, and some of those electrons are, as they transfer, are used to fuel other processes. Used to fuel other processes. Okay? Make sense? You do love it? You love it, right? You love it, right? It's Wednesday. Wednesday's a great day. You, 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 gotta, you just gotta love everything on Wednesdays. Unless it's evil, right? You don't need to love evil. But this is not evil. This is good. It's just hard, right? It's just hard. Okay, so here's a redox reaction. Here you take uh, one that, you know, is, is not, not as present in living forms. This is a combustion reaction, uh, or you can look at it uh, as, a, as a redox reaction. So we are taking methane, we are burning it in the presence of oxygen to produce carbon dioxide and water. Here you took carbon that was sharing all of its electrons evenly with its hydrogen counterparts. You react it, you burn it in the presence of oxygen to generate carbon dioxide. This carbon, it still has eight valence electrons, right? This carbon has eight valence electrons. This carbon has eight valence electrons. You see how they're drawn closer to oxygen? This is oxygen is an electron hog, right? It's like when you share your life with someone like me, you know? Like, you, you still get 
full access to what's in the house, but I'm going to take more than my fair share because I'm selfish and I'm bigger than everyone in my house. I don't know how much longer that'll work with my son. Well, the, the, the jury's still out on whether he's going to be a big guy or not. But for the time being, you're like, wow, Dr. Ingo, you're a horrible person. You're right, but every day I'm molded further into the image of Christ and become less of a horrible person. So, all right. Any questions about this? Going to get a little bit more big picture. Okay? So big picture, carbons reduced during photosynthesis, oxidized during cellular respiration. It's not a complete oxidation. It's not a complete reduction. What are the major steps of cellular respiration? What are the major steps? <sighs> okay. So during cellular respiration, we take electrons from fuel molecules and we shuttle them through several intermediates to ultimately get them to oxygen, the, the, the supreme electron hog. Not the supreme, actually. Fluorine's the supreme electron hog. But fluorine, there's just not a, nearly as much of it as there is oxygen. Okay? So you, you, you take electrons from our fuel molecules, you shuttle them through several intermediates, ultimately to oxygen. And when you do, you, you form water and carbon dioxide. And so here is the, um, the overall reaction of cellular respiration. The overall reaction of cellular respiration. We take a sugar, often we, 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 we use glucose as our example, but you know from lab on Monday, if you had lab on Monday, um, and you'll know from lab tomorrow if you have lab tomorrow, like we can use things that aren't glucose. Fructose works just as well as glucose does. Sucrose, pound for pound, works just as well as glucose does. Okay, And so we can take alternative sugars, we react them uh, in the presence of oxygen, and we take 32 ADP, 32 inorganic phosphates, we get six molecules of water, six molecules of carbon dioxide, and 32 ATP. Now, I think I mentioned to you this to you earlier in the semester. And I said, this is the reaction that we use to represent cellular respiration. But it's, this reaction is not taking place in your body. Did I tell you this before? Because if this reaction took place in your body, that would be a very violent reaction to take place in your body. Okay? Have you seen what happens when you light sugar on fire? Have you ever made creme brulee? It's a delicate balance, right? You're like, I need to toast the top of this, get a nice crunchy top, right? Caramelize those sugars. But it's very easy to go too far. and catches fire, your whole house burns down. You're like, I just wanted some creme brulee. Like, I just wanted to deep fry a turkey my kitchen. It's just like some things are better left to the professionals. All right. So we've got a suite of enzymes that are called dehydrogenase enzymes. And dehydrogenase enzymes facilitate these <coughs> redox reactions. So whenever you see dehydrogenase at the end of an enzyme name, you need to be looking for the electrons. Where are the electrons coming from? Where are they going? Where are the electrons coming from? Where are they going? What's that? Nothing? Okay. All right. So the most common electron carrier used in this process is NAD. NAD, NAD plus. And this is nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, and it gets reduced, that is, it gains electrons, and it also gains a hydrogen ion. And so if we look at this, initially it has a plus one charge, yes? It takes on a hydrogen ion, which has what kind of a charge? A plus charge. So that should be two positive charges, but now it's neutral as NADH, how many electrons did it gain in that process of the reduction? Two, right? It already had one positive charge. It gained a second positive charge, but now it's neutral. Okay, so if you're going to balance two positive charges, it took on two negative charges as well in the form of two electrons. So every time you see NADH, you need to see two electrons, okay? NADH, two electrons that we can use 
uh, in another part of cellular respiration. All right. <sighs> cellular respiration takes place in, in three steps. First, glycolysis. Oh, man, these are coming in the wrong order. That's terrible. I'll just make them all come. Okay. So glycolysis, which happens in the cytosol, in the fluid of the cell. Pyruvate oxidation and the citric acid cycle are basically a, a single step. They're step 2A and 2B, but both part of step 2. Pyruvate oxidation and the citric acid cycle. This happens in the mitochondrial matrix, in the inside of both mitochondrial membranes. And then the third step, oxidative phosphorylation in the inner membrane of the mitochondria. Okay, so glycolysis in the cytosol, pyruvate oxidation in the Krebs cycle, 2A and 2B inside of the mitochondrial matrix, oxidative phosphorylation in the inner mitochondrial membrane. The inner membrane of the mitochondria. We have a couple more slides and then we'll, we'll take our lecture break. This here and this here provides you the most useful big picture to put all of this stuff that you need to memorize inside. Okay? So it makes it a lot more likely that you are going to remember what's going on. You're going to keep track of everything that needs to happen. You're going to remember everything that's going on. You're going to be in the best position to be able to answer any question that you get on glycolysis, the Krebs cycle, or oxidative phosphorylation. All right, being that this is the most important, this and this, these are the most important elements of the big picture. Do you all have any questions? Okay, if they come as we work our way through this, make sure that, that you ask them. Okay, a couple more slides, and then we'll, we'll, we'll do our lecture break. Okay, so three steps of cellular respiration. Step one, we've got glycolysis in the cytosol, and here we get some ATP formed. You see that? We're forming some ATP during glycolysis. Ultimately, in glycolysis, we take glucose and other fuel molecules, usually sugars, and we convert them into pyruvate. So at the end of step one, you have the material that you need for the beginning of step two, right? Step two is pyruvate oxidation in the Krebs cycle. So this happens where? Where does step two happen again? Inside the mitochondrial matrix. So inside both mitochondrial membranes, we oxidize, we oxidize pyruvate and oxidation, oxidation is what? It's a loss of electrons. And when we talked about oxidizing carbons, we take them from being in a sugar molecule ultimately to in what molecule? Again, going carbon dioxide. Going back to that ring I showed you, that in photosynthesis we reduce carbon from carbon dioxide into sugar, right? In cellular respiration, we oxidize carbon from the sugar into carbon dioxide. Okay? So if we oxidize some carbon here, we're gonna start to generate what? In addition to this, what are we also gonna generate if we oxidize pyruvate? carbon dioxide okay remember that okay keep keep in mind what these terms mean they're not they're not meaningless terms they mean something when you say oxidation and you're talking about carbon you need to think we're generating carbon dioxide okay we also and then we do a citric acid cycle here we get some more ATP formed and during the citric acid cycle we oxidize the rest of our carbons so we take now, at the end of the citric acid cycle, all six carbons that we started with in glucose or some other sugar molecule are now oxidized into carbon dioxide. Okay? And so you're like, oh, cool. Why is this a ring then if we've, you know, eliminated all of our carbons? We're done with them. What's the ring got to do with it? Remember that. We'll, we'll come back to that. But here, we've oxidized all of our carbons at this point, meaning we've stripped all of the electrons away that we can and now we can use those electrons for this last pro, uh, process, oxidative phosphorylation, also known as the electron transfer system. Now we're taking those electrons, we're gonna bounce them down a series of complexes, ultimately to our final electron acceptor, which is 
from our big picture? What's the final electron acceptor? What's that ultimate electron hog? Oxygen. oxygen, right? And I told you really fluorine is, but there's very little fluorine. So oxygen's that ultimate electron hog, okay? And then when they get to oxygen, they're gonna generate water. Isn't that wonderful that you generate water as a process of cellular respiration? There are some animals that live in desert environments that never in their lives drink a single drop of water. Every bit of water they need to carry out their life comes from their metabolism or whatever water's in the food that they eat. It's cool, right? It's not part of this class. It's, it's just bonus information. Here's NAD+, nicotinamide, dinucleotide, or adenine dinucleotide. And so here's adenine here. And then here's uh, nicotinamide, but the dinucleotide, we've got two different nucleotides here. And you're like, wow, this is really strange. This is a really weird molecule. And it is, but it's perfectly designed to be a transient electron carrier. It's great at receiving electrons, but it's not super great at holding on to them. It's great at receiving electrons, not super good at holding on to them. So it's a great thing to carry them for a while, carry them to something else. Here's a mitochondrion. Here's the mitochondrial matrix inside both mitochondrial membranes. Meaning, if pyruvate is produced in glycolysis, it's produced where? In the cytosol, in the fluid of the cell. Where does pyruvate oxidation in the Krebs cycle happen? Inside here. Which means we've got to diffuse or we've got to move pyruvate across two membranes. Okay? It's an energetically, potentially an energetically costly endeavor. Okay? Keep that in mind as well. All right, so we're, we're, gonna do, we're gonna do our lecture break. So what I want you to do is this. Take the overall reaction of cellular respiration, and even though that reaction doesn't happen, that's the overall big picture of where everything goes. And it tells you that we make 32 ATP during this process. I want you to, using zero notes, only what's in your head and the head of the person next to you, I want you to allocate the ATP to our three different stages. How much is going to come from glycolysis? How much is going to come from stage two, the pyruvate oxidation in the Krebs cycle? And how much is going to come from oxidative phosphorylation? Okay? Using, don't, without using the notes, without using the slides, using only what's in your mind and the mind of the person next to you, I want you to allocate those ATP. Tell us where they are. All right? Another 20 seconds or so. Okay. So, somebody remind me what step one is. Glycolysis. Step one is glycolysis. Yay. <laughs> what about step two? Pyruvate oxidation plus the Krebs cycle. Pyruvate oxidation plus the Krebs or if you want to call it the citric acid cycle or the TCA cycle, it's fine, just different names for the same thing. Just like in class on Monday, no, maybe on Friday, where we had beta-galactosidase and lactase, two names for the same enzyme. Anyways, so what's step three? Oxidation. Oxidative 
phosphorylation, oxidative phosphorylation. And now the question is, how much ATP do we produce in each of these steps? So here's the steps, and here will be the amount of ATP produced. Glycolysis, how many ATP are we producing? Peyton? Six. Six? Two. Two. Two ATP. Now we produce four, but we have to invest two, so we get a net of two in glycolysis. So of the 32 ATP that we get during cellular respiration, two of them come from glycolysis. Okay? What about pyruvate oxidation in the Krebs cycle? Two more. So from pyruvate oxidation and the Krebs cycle collectively, we get two more ATP. So of the 32 ATP we produce during this process, four of them are produced in the first two steps. The rest are produced in step three. And 32 minus four is? 28. 28 of our ATP are produced during step three, oxidative phosphorylation. And you're like, why don't we just do step three? What do we have at the beginning of step three? The two oxides. The two types of electron carriers, right? We've got NADH and we have FADH2, and we'll talk about both of those in a minute. But we're starting with electrons in an oxidative phosphorylation. And the source of our electrons were the first two steps. So the first two steps generate a little bit of ATP and a whole lot of electrons. And then the electrons in step three is where you generate the, the remaining ATP. As those electrons move, that electrical energy fuels a process of ATP formation. Okay? Make sense? Now, you cannot do these two steps if there's no oxygen. So I want you to write this as well. If no oxygen, you see this O2, that's oxygen? So if no oxygen, we don't do these two steps. But I want you to make it clear that only if, if there's no oxygen, we don't do these two steps. Meaning, if you are metabolizing in the absence of oxygen, how many ATP are you getting? Two. Two. And that's it. And that's it. And that's why if you're going to run a marathon, you got to train to run a marathon. Okay, because if you just try to run a marathon with no training, you're very quickly going to run out of oxygen in your muscle tissues. You're going to start generating very little energy and no way to replenish that oxygen because you haven't increased the blood flow to those muscles. You're going to cramp up. Okay. I don't know why you would ever want to run a marathon, but if you do, it's a good idea to train for it. I had a guy uh, in my small group at church when we lived in Ohio. And he decided one day he was going to run a 50K. So 50K is 32 miles. No training, really. I mean, he trained for like a couple of weeks and, and ran the 50K. And he got about 15,000 kilometers through it and then, and then cramped up and fell over and couldn't move. <laughs> Somebody had to come shovel him off, you know, <laughs> in the street. But he did try. Noble. All right. So how does glycolysis work? So overall in the process of glycolysis, we take a six carbon glucose or some other sugar uh, and we break it down into two molecules of pyruvate. Each molecule is a three carbon molecule. So we take a six carbon sugar and we break it down into two molecules of pyruvate. So we're accounting for all of our carbon there, yes? We start with one six carbon molecule and we end with two three carbon molecules. Two times three is six. So we have accounted for all of our carbons, meaning that during glycolysis, you should not produce what? Carbon dioxide. Okay. You should not produce carbon dioxide because we're already accounting for all of our carbons. And that's why the first time I mentioned to you, here's where you should expect to see carbon dioxide was in pyruvate oxidation. Okay, pyruvate oxidation. All right. Glycolysis, we can take it and break it into two parts. The first half, reactions one through five, 
These are the energy investment stages of glycolysis. So reactions one through five, these are the energy requiring stages. Notice we are actually investing two ATP to carry out reactions one through five. Two ATP are required and we generate two molecules of G3P. And if you wanna know what G3P stands for, it stands for glyceraldehyde three phosphate. But knowing it as G3P is plenty good enough, okay? It's like NASCAR. You don't need to know what NASCAR stands for to know what NASCAR means. You know that NASCAR is an acronym? National Association of Stock Car Auto Racing? You didn't even know, did you? But you see, you knew what NASCAR meant without knowing what the acronym stands for. So we could go G3P, and that's fine, if that's what you know it as. Okay, so in steps one through five, we take a glucose molecule, we produce two molecules of G3P, and that process requires two ATP, the energy investment stages. The second five reactions are your recruitment stages, where you get energy back, your return stages. Okay, in the second five reactions, you take those two molecules of G3P, and you convert them into two molecules of pyruvate. And during these steps, you get four molecules of ATP and two molecules of NADH. And when you see NADH, what do you see? Two electrons each. So if we've got two of them, how many electrons? Four electrons. Okay, That's good, right? This big picture stuff first helps you as you memorize these things, right? You know what you need. And so you've only got a certain number of pieces that can, you know, provide for that need. All right, first five reactions, we invest two. Second five reactions, we get four back. Two minus four is, of course, or four minus two. Two minus four is negative two. Four minus two is two net ATP that we get from glycolysis. So here's the overall reaction. And just like when we give the overall reaction for cellular respiration, this specific reaction does not take place. Instead, this overarching process shows what happens during 10 individual reactions of glycolysis. We take two or one molecule of glucose, two molecules of ADP, two inorganic phosphates, two molecules of NAD+, and we generate two molecules of pyruvate, Two molecules of NADH, how many total electrons? Four, two in each, four total. Two uh, hydrogen ions and two molecules of ATP. Two molecules of ATP. Okay, maintain this big picture. First five, energy investment. Second five, energy return. Okay, plus some electrons on our NADH, yeah. Oh, because uh, this is like net. So net, we invest, net, we get two ATP in return. So when all 10 reactions have taken place, we, we see two ADP were permanently converted into ATP until they're used otherwise. So now in the early parts, we, we had to take two ATP as a reactant, and we got two ADP, but then we also took four ADP as a reactant, produced four ATP, so just... It whittled it down. It simplified it to just give you the, the net overall process. That make sense? Okay. So if you wanted to write it out, you could put two ATP over here, but then we would need to make this four ADP. And then we put two ADP over here and make this four ATP. And then so then you just kind of whittle it down and simplify it down. You know, like if... If you've got 20 people in the classroom and four of them, you know, want a particular item, like we can narrow that down to, what would it be, one in five? And so it's just kind of simplifying it down. Okay, Keep, so the, the ADP plus intermediate phosphate are not the two ATP molecules that we No, 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 this is, and again, this is because this isn't representing like a single reaction, this is representing an overall process, what happens. Okay. All right. So here's a, a visual representation of the overall process of glycolysis. Our first five 
reactions are energy requiring. We take one molecule of glucose, get two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate or G3P. Second five are energy releasing or energy return. We take two molecules of G3P and we generate two molecules of pyruvate. Along the way, we also generate four ATP and two molecules of NADH. All right, and so here's a nice little summary of what needs to take place during glycolysis. And this is something that you should always check against what you're doing and uh, make sure you're keeping track of everything you're going to use and everything you're going to produce. Any questions? Okay. Where does the energy come from? Where does the energy come from? Overall, during glycolysis, uh, we, we produce two net molecules of ATP through what we call substrate-level phosphorylation. Substrate-level phosphorylation means that we took phosphorus, we attached it to something using an enzyme. Okay? And in this case, we took a phosphorus, we attached it to ADP using an enzyme. Using an enzyme. <coughs> Two ATP are invested, four ATP are produced for a net of two ATP every time you run through glycolysis. Two ATP are produced every time you run through glycolysis. So if you had 10 molecules of glucose and each one of them is worth two ATP, 10 glucose molecules are worth 20 ATP if all you can do is glycolysis, right? Now, if you could do the whole process, 10 glucose molecules are worth 320 ATP, right? Which is more than 20, I think. Yes? Yeah. It's Wednesday, and my math tends to be better on Wednesdays than on Mondays. Okay, you have to keep in mind that since in reactions one through five, we take one molecule and generate two, right? In reactions one through five, we took one glucose molecule and we generate two molecules of G3P, right? Yes. So that means reactions six through 10 happen twice, one for each of those two molecules of G3P. Okay, and so oftentimes when you draw these out, it only draws it out as one of those molecules of G3P. And so you have to keep in mind that that happens twice for every one glucose molecule. Because in steps one through five, we take one glucose molecule and we generate two G3P. Right? Yes. Okay. And then in steps six through ten, we take two G3P and we generate what? Two pyruvate. So when we get to the pyruvate oxidation and the Krebs cycle, pyruvate oxidation and the Krebs cycle happen two times for every one glucose molecule. Right? Because you get two pyruvates for every one glucose molecule. Now, something to keep in mind. We talked about this last time, but oftentimes one of the products of the overall metabolic process is um, acts as an inhibitor for an earlier step in the process. If the cell has a lot of ATP, it will not continue to go through cellular respiration. And the reason why is ATP actually acts as an inhibitor for one of our enzymes. Phosphofructokinase is one of our enzymes in glycolysis. So if there's a lot of ATP, this ATP is bound to phosphofructokinase as an allosteric inhibitor or a non-competitive inhibitor, keeping that enzyme from being able to do its job. Okay. And so this prevents phosphofructokinase from being able to do its job of actually hydrolyzing ATP and attaching a phosphate group onto uh, fructose 6-phosphate. But we'll, we'll see all of this uh, in a moment. Okay, so if you were, I don't know, hypothetically asked this question on a 
on, on an exam and it just said, where does the energy come from in glycolysis? What would you do to answer that question? Write down everything that's on the side. <laughs> no, that would force you to memorize a lot of it, but that's, that's okay if you want to do that. You could answer it one of two ways. You could either say substrate level phosphorylation, okay, because that's basically how we're generating ATP during glycolysis, or uh, you could say it came from the fuel molecule. It came from glucose, and we're converting the chemical energy of glucose uh, into chemical energy in the form of ATP. However you wanted to answer that would be perfectly satisfactory. Yeah, the second one would be to say that it, it came from our fuel molecule. So ultimately, we were converting the chemical energy in glucose into chemical energy in the form of ATP. Yeah, Davis. Can you also say that from the oxidation of like the, the glucose molecule? Yeah, you can't, you can't say that because then you have to go more holistically. So through the whole process of cellular respiration, yes, the energy comes from oxidation, but you don't access the energy produced from oxidation in glycolysis until you do oxidative phosphorylation. Yeah. So here is substrate level phosphorylation. We take an enzyme, and this enzyme takes a phosphate group from this donor molecule and it attaches it onto ADP to form ATP. This is substrate level phosphorylation, okay? Happens during glycolysis four times, right? Because we generate four ATP. Now we had to invest two, so we get a net of two, but substrate level phosphorylation happens four times during glycolysis, where we take a phosphate group from a donor molecule, one of our th molecules present in Glycolysis and we attach it onto ADP. Yeah, so Levi. ADP is just ADP. With, with one less phosphate. Yep, because the D stands for dye and the T stands for tri. Yep. Okay. So this is a figure from a textbook, uh, a, a textbook different from yours, although your textbook has, has a good figure as well. And what it does is it walks you through all 10 reactions of glycolysis. All 10 reactions of glycolysis. Okay? And so here are the first five. And so in the first five, you know we need to invest two ATP, and we need to get from glucose to two molecules of G3P. So when you get to the bottom of here, it says two molecules of G3P. So perfect. And then in six through 10, you know we need to get from two molecules of G3P to two molecules of what? Pyruvate, and that's noted here. And we also know that we need to generate four ATP. Here's one, here's two, how is that four? Here's one, here's two, how is that four? Six through 10 are done twice for every one glucose molecule, right? Because we took one glucose molecule, we generated two molecules of G3P, meaning we do each of these reactions two times. Okay, and so here's what I'm going to say about this. You need to know, for each of the 10 reactions in glycolysis, you need to know the enzyme that catalyzes that reaction, okay, and the, the proper order, okay, so you need to know 10 enzyme names and the proper order in which they appear in glycolysis, and you need to know basic, what you start with and what you end with in every reaction. What you start with and what you end with in every reaction. You also need to know which reactions produce ATP, which reactions require ATP, and which reactions produce NADH. And it's a lot. It is a lot. You bet. So you need to know all 10 enzymes, which reaction they catalyze, so basically the order of those enzymes. You need to know what you start with and what you end with in each of those 10 reactions. And you need to know which reactions produce ATP, which reactions require ATP, 
and which reactions produce NADH. Now, some of the work will be done for you based on the name of the enzymes. That if you can remember the name of the enzyme, it will tell you either what you started with or what you end with or some of the other information as well. So here's what I would encourage you to do. I think this is the absolute best way to memorize this. I would suggest that you take 10 index cards or 10 sheets of paper and on one side of it, you write one enzyme each, okay? And on the other side of that, the corresponding enzyme, you write on the other side of that sheet of paper, the other side of that index card, what do you start with in that reaction? What do you end with in the reaction? And whether or not anything else of significance happens. Like, did you use an ATP? Did you generate an ATP? Did you generate an ADH? And then what I would do if I were you is I would practice organizing those index cards into either the first five or the second five steps of glycolysis and in the proper order no matter which side you were looking at. And it's only 10 reactions, right? It could be 50, you know, but it's not. It's 10. All right. So this is what I would encourage you to do. And because this is a heavy, a heavy assignment, we're in class a little bit early today. It's currently 1235. We're about five minutes before our end time. So I will give you five minutes worth of time to get to work on memorizing these uh, reactions. Yeah. Uh, Doctor, are the, are the red letters stuff in between, are they the enzymes? Or are they These? No. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, those, those are, are the enzymes. enzymes. Yep. Okay. Can, can you make that thing super wide? Yeah, you have access to these slides on Canvas. But, like, you can't really see, 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 really see it in. You can't see it? No, the textbook, right? It doesn't look good? No, it doesn't look good. It's blurry. It's blurry? Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I'll try to get you a better version of this. Yeah. Did you? Well, not everybody has the rest of it. 